Why, hello there, fellow sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, we need to talk about Cosby, I'm told. Take a look at this trailer. Spanish fly, the girl would drink it, and hello, America. Bill Cosby had been one of my heroes. I'm a black man, stand-up comic. I was born in the 70s. But this? More trouble for Bill Cosby. The accusations just keep coming in. This was complicated. How do we talk about Bill Cosby? Uh -uh. It's complex, Kamal, you know? <sighs> Bill Cosby was our teacher. Kind of center of morality all throughout his career. Made my grandmother laugh, made everybody in the house laugh. Oh, no, no. You can't speak about black America in the 20th century and not talk about Bill Cosby. Thank you. That's a trailer for a Showtime docu-series, and its subject matter is not exactly our topic today, but for our purposes, it does raise an interesting Christian and cultural question, which is, can we separate art from the artist? Is there a line in which supporting the art or work of a morally objectionable artist becomes untenable, and is that why none of you buy my books? I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your morally objectionable artist today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> Here's a painting of Mother Mary with baby Jesus. Nice little subject matter. Is this a good painting? Do you like this painting? You do? Well, that's a painting by Adolf Hitler, you monster! There is a common Christian expression which is, love the sinner, hate the sin. And that's sometimes derided, particularly when it comes to issues of identity, where people want to blur the line between sinner and sin in order to justify or excuse away their sin. But it is a biblically justifiable position. God hates sin and evil, Proverbs. The Lord detests the way of the wicked, but he loves those who pursue righteousness. Psalms. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. God hates sin, and he likes it if we also hate sin, Jesus says in Revelation. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And the Bible flat out tells us to hate sin. Back to Proverbs. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. Romans, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. God hates sin and wrongdoing. We're also supposed to hate sin and evil. But here's the thing, we all sin. Romans, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 1 John, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And yet... God still loves us. Back to Romans. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And as God loves us, so too we are to love one another. As it says in 1 John, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So there can be and is a distinction between the sinner and the sin. And that's not really that complicated a concept. We see it displayed all throughout life. I love my kids. I will always love my kids, but I don't always love what they do. I love myself and I'll still feed and clothe and bathe and care for myself, hope for the best for myself, even when I'm very much in moral disappointment. But if we can make a distinction between sin and sinner, then it seems perfectly reasonable to make a distinction between the art and the artist. Bad people can do good things. After all, Jesus says in Matthew, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Human beings are morally complex. We're all sinners, we're all fallen, but good people, good relative to other people, not relative to God, can do bad things, and likewise, bad people, relative to others, can do good things. Some people don't like the doctrine of total depravity, but if you think about it, it really expands your Netflix queue because when you acknowledge that everyone is a sinner deserving of hell, it tends to make you more gracious, not less. It's the delusional, self-righteous among us who are tearing down statues 
statues because accomplishment of history had some notable flaws. You must be morally perfect, where we cannot acknowledge or accept any of your accomplishments or good works. Which is a problematic standard in its own right, but all the more so when the morality enforces nothing but fealty to an ever-changing leftist ideology. Banning good art because you don't like the politics of the artist is particularly silly, but it gets worse, like memory holding the creator from the creation for the great crime of believing that women are women and men are not, which is happening with J.K. Rowling. The New York Times ran an ad capturing that sentiment. Liana is imagining Harry Potter without its creator. And in the HBO Harry Potter reunion special, J.K. Rowling was persona non grata, which I believe is Latin for transphobic witch. Now, I agree that J.K. Rowling is history's greatest monster, but that's mostly because of the introduction of the Time Turners. Oh yeah, you can magically go back in time and save the life of an animal like Buckbeak, but you can't, oh, I don't know, save the life of Harry Potter's parents or prevent Voldemort's return and save Cedric Diggory. Still irritates me. Anyway, the point is, many of these complaints against the artists and demands that they adhere completely to a leftist orthodoxy are largely absurd and don't raise any serious moral questions about engaging with their art. But that's not true of all things. We're all sinners, yes, but we're not all guilty of genocide. And the fact that you would have thrown these people in a concentration camp does make me look at your art a little askance. And admittedly, I'd be somewhat perturbed by someone with a large private collection of Hitler paintings. So where do we draw the line between art and artists, between man and his work? Can we appreciate the Cosby Show and even admire the good it did and the good it offered to the culture while not downplaying the sins of Cosby? Likewise, can we appreciate the works of Roman Polanski, Woody Allen, Brian Singer, or Harvey Weinstein without jeopardizing our moral standards? Well, the Bible doesn't explicitly deal with a topic, and so yet again we are dealing with a gray area and must therefore look at broader principles and follow our conscience and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. If you feel unsettled with engaging with the work of these seriously morally compromised individuals, then don't engage with them. Don't violate your conscience. But since we all want concrete answers, I would will provide you my super duper helpful tips for dealing with the art of morally repulsive people who are usually perverts. Number one, don't reject material for amoral or morally neutral reasons. Things like politics. People can have legitimate disagreements about tax rates and the size and scope of government, and while you might be annoyed by someone's politics like Adam McKay, that's not a great reason to reject all of their work. Number two, the auteur theory is nonsense, which is to say the degree to which someone should reject a work should be proportionate to the degree in which the offending party is involved. So if the offending person is a novelist, not reading their work is a proportional response because there's more centralized control and ownership of the work. But that's not true when it comes to collaborative efforts. A lot of people worked on The Cosby Show. Should they all be punished and their work memory hold? Should I reject all of Miramax's pictures just because a more repulsive and less hygienic version of Jabba the Hutt had a hand in producing them? Should I ban Chinatown because Roman Polanski is a dirtbag and he happened to direct Robert Town's great script? It's got to be proportional to the amount of authorship and involvement. Number three, does the support of the work meaningfully contribute to immorality? Now, arguably, you could say no across the board on that question. Just because we buy a book or an album or a movie doesn't mean that our funding is causing and facilitating immorality. However, it's reasonable, given the moral failings of certain people, to say, I don't want to support that person. But that again can become a matter of degree. I might be disinclined to pay for a movie ticket for the latest Woody Allen film, but if Annie Hall is streaming on Netflix, eh, because that's not the same level of support, which again seems to me to be a reasonable distinction. And finally, number four, I'd rather look at Hitler paintings than anything Pete Davidson does. Which is not really a tip, but I think it's still a good moral stance. Look, in the end, human beings are morally complex. We are all deserving of hell, and yet we are capable of good, and we are capable of evil. What's good should be applauded. What's evil should be condemned. 
And so in principle, we should try to separate the art from the artist while acknowledging that sometimes lines do need to be drawn, and reasonable and moral people can differ on the specifics. And if you'd like to tell me how you differ on this issue, I'd love to hear it. As always, you can reach out to me on the major socials and a few of the minor ones. Like, subscribe, rate, review, leave a comment that helps us out if you like what we're doing here, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. Thank you.